Hey all you cats and kittens and all you non-binary fittens, it's your boy D. Biddles. Welcome back to the Brick Edition. If you were here for the last one of these, you know how this goes. Normally I do plastic models of anime robots and talk about the show that those models are from, before weaving that discussion into some bigger topic that I prattle on about for 40 minutes to an hour. But there ain't none of that here. The Brick Edition has me talking about one or more smaller topics that can't make for a full 50 minute video, and building robots out of these Brand X interlocking construction bricks for some quicker, lighter content. All in all, it's just another Brick in the Edition. The last season of Better Call Saul finally hit Netflix, and I'm prepared to say that I like it way more than Breaking Bad. Not because Breaking Bad isn't good, it's fucking great, but Saul? Saul had me riveted to my seat. And for a series that's about 90% prequel and you kind of already know what happens to most of the characters, that's no small feat. Bob Odenkirk is able to channel such a fun and charismatic but slimy wise guy persona while also delivering on the serious dramatic moments so he's just a lot more fun to watch as a main character than the dour and grumpy old man Walter White and uh, fan favorite Jonathan Banks gets more time to do his cold, pragmatic, world-weary ex-cop with a secret soft spot routine, and that's a delight. Michael Mando is quite serviceable as a stand-in for Aaron Paul's Jesse Pinkman. Rhea Seahorn as Kim absolutely makes up for the grating personality of Skylar White, to the point where I often sympathize with her over her male counterpart. And Giancarlo Esposito gives an encore performance in the role that made him everyone's favorite polite and professional yet totally ice-cold villain. Which makes it even more remarkable that he gets outshone by yet another totally charming up until he totally isn't villain in the same fucking series. Holy fuck, Tony Dalton as Lalo Salamanca is a fucking treat. This smiling, silver-tongued psychopath had me hanging on his every syllable from minute one. I don't often find myself wondering if I'm missing out by not watching telenovelas, so this man's doing something right. James Gunn, if you're listening, make Dalton and Esposito your Joker and Lex Luthor. I'm not even kidding. Holy fuck. Still need to watch El Camino at some point, though. <sighs> so I guess aliens might be a thing we have to worry about now? So in case you missed it, Air Force veteran and former military intelligence official David Grush came forward as a whistleblower announcing that the U.S. government is in possession of a non-terrestrial spacecraft and also the bodies of dead occupants from that vessel, some of whom may not be human. He says that while he has not seen these things himself, some former colleagues have shown him reports and photographs documenting these incidents. So you know. A friend told me. Trust me, bro. He was interviewed by News Nation on June 5th, and since then has petitioned Congress to oversee a hearing on UFOs. And as wild as these claims are, he does seem to have a credible background, having worked for the government tracking this sort of thing as part of the Unidentified Aerial Phenomena Task Force, during which time he helped to draft the National Defense Authorization Act which included provisions for legal protections for and exemptions to non-disclosure orders in regards to whistleblowers reporting on UFOs. Huh, that's convenient. Also, the NDAA rolled back requirements for armed service members to be vaccinated against COVID, which is weird. Anyways, UFO sightings seem to be on the rise this year. And that's understandable. Part of that is surely in response to that Chinese spy balloon from back in February, either legitimately increased notice of something we had previously overlooked, or paranoia from people who are now overly anxious about foreign powers. And I feel like that's kind of my first major problem with this. The whole thing feels like it's just another all-too-common occurrence these days of pandering to or enabling all the most mentally ill people in our country, and not in a way that meaningfully helps them. Is life beyond our world possible, nay, probable? Hell yeah. The universe is too big and getting bigger every second, and it'd be vain and stupid to just assume that there isn't something else out there besides us. 
With as goofy and mixed up as humanity is, it's also totally possible that at least some of that life is doing better than us in a lot of ways, up to and including interplanetary travel. And is it possible they've already made some limited contact with us? Absolutely. Maybe by accident, maybe deliberately, maybe in secret from a distance, maybe they're actively trying to get in touch, maybe they've already deeply embedded in our world, maybe they've had a look and decided to keep clear of us like we're some kind of intergalactic hornet's nest they've decided is best to live and let live. I have no idea. But until we have something really concrete, especially with such a limited capacity for us to explore the universe beyond our planet, I think us laymen putting too much stock in them is a fool's errand. Anything and everything is possible. Psychic powers, magic, time travel, cryptids, angels, flying spaghetti monsters, ghosts. But unless you're actually interested in making this field of study your life's academic ambition, I think that us as hobbyists getting too invested in proving their existence is very likely something that's done as a coping mechanism for a lot of unhealthy thinking. Not for everyone, but for some. For some people, the random injustice and cruelty of this world has shaken them quite hard, and they latch on to preposterous explanations for why the world is the way it is. Anti-vaxxers, flat earthers, QAnon, etc. It's all different flavors of the same mental illnesses, of isolation, bitterness, misanthropy, distrust, and paranoia. For some people, it's easier to believe ridiculous and improbable things like a cabal of secret lizard-skinned supervillains in volcano fortresses pledging themselves to Lord Xenu, rather than just acknowledge that some people in power have established very easily understandable systems by which they take what they want and screw the rest of us over. Some people, it doesn't matter what evidence you present or logical in inconsistencies you expose, they'll just say something like, THAT'S WHAT THEY WANT YOU TO THINK! WAKE UP, SHEEPLE! And too many of those people are moving out of the realm of their parents' basements and 4chan forums and are moving into the mainstream. One such individual is Tim Burchett, U.S. House Representative from Tennessee and a big fan of David Grush's story and Burchette has taken a keen interest in investigating this claim. Burchette is also a big advocate against the legitimacy of the 2020 presidential election. You know, the highly scrutinized and totally verified election that even Trump-appointed judges deem to be legitimate and ethical. And this guy wants to know more about the aliens. Great. Furthermore, Grush's own inclusion of that COVID thing in the bill he drafted is pretty suspect. Now look, I believe in conspiracies. It's just that all of mine involve things like Monsanto putting high fructose corn syrup in all our food, or the CIA doing shitty things to other countries so that we can take their oil. You know, the kind of stuff that doesn't double as a plot for a Marvel Disney original series. And I fear that not only is all these politicians and government agents talking about Jewish space lasers and satanic pedophiles bad for people who are seriously mentally ill, but it's bad for discourse in a way that feels almost calculated. So like, instead of asking how come the US doesn't have affordable health care, including mental health care, like Canada or the UK or Botswana or India or Israel, Singapore, Denmark, Finland, France, etc. Instead of asking why we don't have that, we instead have to spend time reassuring your crazy uncle that no, the pod people are not coming to get him, they're not trying to turn him trans, and the rest of us don't have microchips in our brain from the Fauci ouchie. Also, and this probably goes without saying, but like, it would be really inopportune for aliens to be a whole thing at this exact moment in human history. We kinda have a lot going on right now, what with the late stage capitalism putting a squeeze on us, and climate change, and having absolute psychopaths be in charge of almost everything important. You know, the usual, am I right? Having aliens show up right now would be like just getting out of the shower so you can immediately have violent diarrhea, and then getting a call from your boss who has some questions about an important upcoming project. Meanwhile, your dog is having a seizure, and your in-laws from out of town are making a surprise visit and are currently knocking on the door for you to let them in. 
just like any one of those things demands your full attention. Additionally, and I've got a whole video coming up where I'll talk about this, but we can't even be nice to all of the people who are sharing this planet with us. People who have the same biology, the same evolutionary psychology, the same basic needs and desires, the same vested interest in this chunk of rock we're all living on. We can't even be nice with our fucking neighbors. So how well do you think humans are going to get along with some little green men, or some socialist hippie Catulans, or some non-carbon-based lifeforms that aren't easy for internet artists to draw porno of, so that at least the horny internet dweebs are willing to hear them out? You know, they might come in peace, but we sure fucking don't. <sighs> so I guess Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg are going to have a steel cage match? Or at least they both say they are. You know how it goes, powerful people promise things all the time. Yes, we'll forgive student loan debts. Yes, we're working on green energy. Yes, we're making America great again. Yes, Overwatch 2 will be a worthwhile game with content and modes that justify purchasing a new game and eliminating the old game. Yes, the submarine tour of the Titanic is totally safe, etc. But unless what they're promising is bad, you probably shouldn't believe them. And two of the richest dudes participating in a ruthless blood sport that is sure to humiliate or seriously injure one or both of them sounds like some too-good-to-be-true nonsense. Though with Elon throwing shade and picking fights with George Soros, Bill Gates, and now Zuck, dude better chill the fuck out lest these guys get annoyed with him enough to team up and murk him. So on second thought, keep it up, Elon. Beep -de -deep. Uh, we are receiving a breaking news bulletin, it seems. Um, Elon Musk's mommy has come out with a public statement, basically saying, You rowdy boys, stop fighting. Please don't hurt my Elon. And um, Elon Musk, if you are listening to this, please don't let your mom make you look like a pussy. Uh, it would be really embarrassing for you after you step to Mark Zuckerberg in the first place. Uh, for you to just back out now. The the crowd demands blood, Elon. And, you know, you're doing something really remarkable here by making people root for Mark Zuckerberg. So, do not back out now, dude. Moving on. Hey, uh, remember my Gundam Aerial video? Of course you do. I know you all watch that shit. Aside from the bad audio, I regard the contents of that video as some of my best so far because I'm just so proud of my own mediocrity. And since you obviously remember that video, you obviously remember me making the point that anime and manga could at any point in time be the subject of censorship and possibly prohibition, from wackos who might get a wild hair up their ass because wackos be whack. And yeah, in a small way, it kinda happened. A group called Moms for Liberty has taken umbrage with the manga series Assassination Classroom, and is trying to get it banned from schools, having already succeeded in a couple school districts in Wisconsin and obviously Florida, because Florida schools just kind of have a thing against basically all books right now. And like, real quick, you ever notice how all these fucking weirdo organizations have the word liberty ironically included in their name, or else some kind of weird nationalistic reference like Patriots or For America? Fucking, come on guys, just call yourselves the fun police. It's what you are. All these nationalistic org names sure do bring to mind the old America First slogan that was coined by Woodrow Wilson in 1916 and then used through the 40s to advocate for policies that I'm too lazy to look up right now, but I'm sure were historically very good and smart and moral and not in any way a smokescreen for hate. Anyways, their issue is that they don't want students to think it's okay to kill their teachers. Now, taking into account all the frequent public shootings and school shootings that apparently our elected officials are just helpless to do anything about while they toddle off to cash fat checks from the NRA, on knee-jerk reaction, I kinda get why they might feel that way. But that's just my initial reaction before my brain starts working. So let me break it down for you bit by bit and explain why this is not a measured and reasonable response from these concerned parent groups. For one, students don't automatically just jump from reading works of fiction to immediately enacting the extreme acts portrayed within. They don't read 
the Hunger Games, for example, and then immediately set about attempting to violently dismantle the oppressive bourgeoisie system of government that pits people against each other as a distraction from the true source of their misery. In many ways, I kind of wish that were true. Yes, I did just get done making a few videos about how media themes can influence thinking for better or worse, but like, everything can? And there's a world of difference between kids reading manga that inspires them to write down the names of their bullies in their notebooks, pretending that the Shinigami will strike them down with heart attacks. There's a world of difference between that and students reading a manga and then coming to school with guns to kill the faculty with. If the latter occurs, it's because a lot of factors have gone into that equation and not just the one factor of children reading manga. How do I know this? Because this sort of thing almost never happens in the manga's home country of Japan. The only high-profile public shooting in Japan in recent memory involved one guy using a makeshift weapon to assassinate former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. He HAD to use a homemade firearm because Japan has very strict anti-gun laws. And I don't know what manga led him to do that, but that's a lot closer to the Hunger Games messaging than it is assassination classrooms. For a second, I actually am familiar with the story of assassination classroom. I watched the anime a few years back and honestly, uh, the title's a little misleading. The story involves this unkillable, super fast alien blowing up part of the moon and then threatening to blow up the entire world in one year's time unless the Japanese government lets him teach a class of middle schoolers to assassinate him. Yeah, I, I know, that's very silly, but that's what he wants. He promises not to harm any of the students, he promises to also teach the students actual academics in line with standard middle school curriculum during this time, and due to his unique physiology, he cannot be harmed with conventional weaponry. Uh, apparently there's a certain specially treated plastic that's like his kryptonite, so all of the weapons that the students use aren't actually dangerous to anyone but him. And the children are incentivized to try and murder him not only by virtue of not wanting the planet to blow up, but by the Japanese government offering a billion yen cash prize to the student who succeeds. So, yeah, it's a long way to go to make this premise work, but they get there eventually. Because of his various superpowers and his otherwise invulnerable body, the kids affectionately dub him Koro-sensei, or Unkillable Teacher, and they set about plotting ways to shiv him while he's writing out equations at the blackboard. And obviously, Koro-sensei doesn't make it easy on them, and he divides his time between actual academics, pointers on assassination, and life lessons for the real world like he's some kind of anime welcome back cotter. And as time goes on, the kids and Koro-sensei develop a real, meaningful, fulfilling, and educational mentor-student relationship. I'm not going to go into his whole backstory and motivation for this little arrangement, because it's longer and more convoluted than the premises set up, but he genuinely means well, and the students all become very reluctant to kill their teacher. Again, it's complicated, and they end up HAVING to murder him by the end of the final semester, both for plot reasons and for thematic reasons of the next generation replacing the previous and striving to make the world a better place and blah de blah de blah But by the end, there's not a dry eye in the cast between the students, the government-sponsored teacher's aides, and Koro-sensei himself as he bids them to approach all their various goals in life with the dedication, persistence, and focus of a trained assassin. So yeah, the whole kill your teacher premise is framed through this highly specific and entirely unrealistic scenario, and the kids end up not wanting to do it in the end. So it's only barely about assassinations, and the messaging is more achieve your full potential rather than, hey kids, do you like violence? It's a Shonen Jump series, so it's specifically tailored to an audience of 10 to 16 year olds in theming and content. Meanwhile, there's all these other Shonen manga like Naruto, Soul Eater, My Hero Academia, Black Clover, Attack on Titan, Jujutsu Kaisen, Blue Exorcist, and about a million others, all of which are way more violent, all of which involve students going to school specifically to learn about fighting, and none of those are subject to any scrutiny. Not that I think they should be, or need to be, but if they're all more intense in their violent content, why is ass class the one getting picked on? 
It means none of these Moms for Liberty actually read the damn thing beyond the cover blurb and like the first 30 pages before immediately concluding that they needed to ban this sick filth. Which is exactly the level of understanding that all these Patriots for Family Values and American Liberty activist groups use on everything they object to. Which kinda goes to show they don't actually care about education or protecting children. Because if they did, well, again, there's way more subversive stuff out there. I bet none of them are writing up petitions about the Hunger Games. I bet none of them care about all the various Greek tragedies where murdering your mentors or your parents is a key plot point. I bet none of them would dare try to ban the Bible from public school libraries despite being known specifically for the most famous arc within that story being the ritual sacrifice of a philosophy teacher who happens to be God's only son for the sake of peace and prosperity and fulfilling an ancient prophecy by which some seven headed dragon is slain or whatever. But books about the Holocaust, or people coming to terms with their sexuality, or some weird foreign comic with a provocative title? Nope. Can't have that. You know, these are the same people who blubber about their free speech being infringed whenever their uncle gets fact-checked on Twitter for posting about vaccines causing mutations, and then subsequently gets banned when he calls the moderation team a bunch of slurs. Hey. What about pressuring legislators to pass common sense gun reform, something that has a 70% national approval, and something that would actually reduce classroom assassinations? I'm actually less interested in what stupid manga get taken out of school libraries, especially since they're still available for purchase at most retailers, and really, I'm more interested in what all that free time that these parent groups use to get manga banned could be put towards. I'm kind of hoping PTA meetings can actually meaningfully work towards figuring out ways to reduce the necessity for active school shooter drills, rather than whinging about imagined scenarios regarding literal children's storybooks. And I say this as someone whose kid is on the cusp of joining the public school system this very year. I wrote that segment in my Valkyrie video and started writing this one about Assassination Classroom before hearing the results of a recent local levy that failed to pass about increasing school funding for our district. And now, because it failed, my kid is only going to attend kindergarten every other day as a cost-cutting measure. That's that much less time spent learning, that much less time interacting with new friends, that much less money for educators, and that much more opportunities for kids to grow up to be mouth-breathing lunatics like these fucking parents. Meanwhile, child labor laws with long-standing precedent that date back to the early days of industrialization where kids being mutilated by factory machinery was commonplace, yeah, those laws are getting hacked to pieces. Yes, child labor laws are being absolutely destroyed by these same people so that underpaying restaurants have a bigger labor pool to pull from so that they don't have to wait so long for exploited laborers to bring them appetizers after the PTA meeting where they just got done bitching about COVID vaccination requirements, or critical race theory, or litter boxes, or children's manga, or whatever other insane non-issue that they heard about on Tim Pool's show. Oh, to live such comfortable lives. Always money to raise the wages of members of Congress who already get fat financial blowjobs from the weapons industry, never enough for fucking teachers. We interrupt this program for another breaking news update. God, every time I think I'm done with this script, another thing happens. This is what I get for trying to be topical. Okay, so apparently the Indiana chapter of the Moms for Liberty sent out an email newsletter that includes a quote from Adolf Hitler in it. Yep, we're just citing the actual worst guy in discussing our children's future. They don't even hide this quote's origin, it's just right there for Missy and Chrissy and any other pissy soccer mom to read and recite back to their cackling friends at brunch while planning their next harassment campaign for teachers. The quote reads, He alone who owns the youth gains the future, with the words owns and gains in all caps as if to emphasize them, which I think is appropriate. These parents don't see kids as budding individuals to nurture and teach into fully grown adults with their own personalities. They see them as something to own, to groom, to condition into being something that they can benefit from. 
This is just a perfect object lesson for how conservatives think when they accuse progressives of trying to indoctrinate and groom children. It's because that's what they're trying to do, and so they just assume everyone is. After coming across this little tidbit, I did a little digging, and boy, the moms for Hitler sure do get around. They've got a whole Wikipedia page dedicated to all their misadventures. Misadventures read as harassment, threats, and shitty public statements. From connections to the Proud Boys and the Three Percenters and various orgs centered around QAnon and Christian nationalism, to fighting COVID safety measures, to openly threatening teachers, to advocating that LGBT students be taught in separate classrooms from their cishet peers, to convincing parents to end their children's counseling sessions, leading to those children attempting suicide, to banning all kinds of books, particularly those involving queer topics and discussions about racial discrimination, the list just goes on. I assume they were involved in Mouse, that graphic novel about the Holocaust getting banned in Tennessee, but I couldn't find any direct evidence of that, though there are certainly chapters of the Hitler moms in that state as well. Boy, that sure was a long way to say, I told you so. Hey, do you guys like Let's Plays? Because if so, you should definitely take a look at this other YouTube channel called Disaster Bastards. Now, I'm not affiliated with Disaster Bastards, but obviously, if I'm plugging another YouTube channel, it's because I'm close to those guys personally. But that doesn't mean I can't also think that there's some fun guys who are worth your time, even if you don't know them in real life. They've had their channel a few months longer than me, so they have more on offer, and they're way less rambly and political than myself, though certainly no less charming. And they're pretty reliably good for a giggle, and definitely have that vibe where you can tell they're fun to hang out and bullshit with in real life. And I think right now they're doing Tears of the Kingdom, so take a look! I sure hope they're okay with this plug getting put right after an extended section about Nazi soccer moms. Anyways, be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe so you can see another rad video like this one coming at you soon! I'm D. Biddles, my channel name is Chatbots, and this has been The Brick Edition.